You're listening to an Axe Church sermon. Axe Church is located in Camas, Washington. You can find out more about us at www.axecamas.org. Check out our other sermons and podcasts. You can find them on iTunes Podcasts, SoundCloud, and our website. This sermon was preached by Pastor David Robinson, who is the teaching pastor at Axe Church. We hope you enjoy the sermon, and we hope that the Lord blesses you through it. We're going to be in John 12. And we're reading verses 12 through 16. Give me one second. Pretty sure it's in the New Testament. There we go. I found it. All right. The next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things are written about him and that they had done these things to him. Today is the Sunday that we celebrate as Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday, and the reason we call it Palm Sunday is because of those palm branches that we just read about that people took and laid in front of Jesus as he rode in to Jerusalem at the beginning of Holy Week, and the people were praising him, right? This is a day that had been prophesied for hundreds of years. For anyone who wanted to look at it, they actually could have done the math, and I talked through that, I think last year in Palm Sunday, I did that. If you want to go back and and watch that sermon from last last year, I talk a lot about the prophetic part of this, right? This had been prophesied. They knew it was going to happen, right? The king of kings was coming in. This was a glorious day. And all these people were crowding around, and they're yelling out, Hosanna, which means save us or savior. They're hailing him as the savior. They saw Jesus as their savior. But by the end of the week, some of them would be yelling, crucify him. The same people who had been yelling, save us, or savior, were yelling, crucify him. Now how does that happen? Maybe the kind of saving that they wanted was not the kind of saving that Jesus was bringing. Maybe they didn't get what they wanted. Maybe it wasn't about Jesus. Maybe it was about them. Listen, when I was young, I wanted a lot of things. I wanted a lot of things. I wanted to be an astronaut when I was young. Um, but I realized that I was afraid of heights. And so <laughs> that wasn't going to work out. I wanted to be a rock star. <clears throat> Those of you who have seen me uh, lead worship know that was never going to happen. Uh, when I was in kindergarten, I actually wanted to be a preacher. That was the one time. My dad was a preacher, and so I remember they asked, draw a picture of what you want to be. I'm an amazing artist, for those of you who have ever seen me draw or seen my handwriting. It's really quite something. Um, But I drew a picture of myself preaching. Like, I wanted to be a preacher, I think, probably because that's what my dad was at the time. I wanted to be a lawyer, which did happen. Um, Not always the best things that we want come to be, but uh, I wanted to be wealthy. I wanted to play in the NFL. I wanted all kinds of stuff, okay? Things that I wanted. But here's the thing. I wanted a lot, but the reason that I wanted each one of these things when when I was younger and when I was growing up was because I wanted happiness. And I saw these things as a way to be happy, as a way to experience pleasure and avoid pain. That's why I wanted them. I didn't necessarily want them for them for themselves, but for what they could bring to me, right? For the happiness that they could provide. And that's been the aim of many people, including a lot of our major philosophers, both at the time that Jesus was around, when the, when the Greek philosophers were around, right, uh, or, or, or their, their philosophies were around. Aristotle thought the highest good was pleasure. Epicurus, you know, the good was pleasure, pain was evil. That was, that was the mindset. We seek out after pleasure, after things that will make us essentially feel good. And we have sort of this self-love problem as human beings. We have a self-love problem. Something that Jesus called loving this life. He talked about loving this life. Jesus talked about finding life, trying to find life or loving life, right? Chasing after life, loving this life. And then he talked about 
taking up your cross, hating this life, dying to yourself, losing this life, and of those two things, the loving this life, the chasing this life, and so on, and the losing this life, and the dying to this life, and, and, and that kind of thing. One of them was good, and one of them was evil. One of them actually led to eternal life and peace and hope, and one of them led ultimately to pain and death and disappointment. Loving this life, seeking after this life, the self-love, the pleasure-seeking, all of that, trying to get there on your own was, is death. And yet losing your life, denying yourself, and giving up yourself to God was life. This was a message that we were sending, which is the opposite. It was a flipping upside down of the way that basically everybody had been looking at the world forever. Forever. Um, Solomon, the king of Israel, this was the son of David. Remember David and Goliath? He had the sling and threw the stone and killed the big guy. Um, his son, Solomon, was a king. And he wrote a book called Ecclesiastes. And in the second chapter, verse 1, it says this. I said in my heart, come now. I will test you with mirth. Therefore, enjoy pleasure. But surely this was also vanity. It says in chapter 5, verse 10. He who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver. Nor he who loves abundance with increase. This also is vanity. Solomon tried riches. This guy was the richest guy probably that's ever lived. There's probably not anybody who was more wealthy than Solomon. At the time that he was reigning, like silver and, and precious stones and stuff were like, they were so common that they were, just, they were almost valueless. He had so much stuff. He had so much stuff. And he tried riches and pleasure and working hard uh, to try to gain stuff and so on, and found that trying to be satisfied by all of these things was vanity. It was in vain. It was worthless. It was like he says, it's like trying to catch the wind in your hands. As the wind's coming by and you go, hey, I got it. Hey, there it is. Right? You're not going to be able to do that. That's what he said. All of these things were like it's vanity. It's in vain. When we try to go our own way and chase after the things that we think we want, we come up empty-handed like trying to catch the wind in our hands. At the end of the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon sums it up. He says this in chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Solomon just tells us straight, listen, this is your purpose. Fear God and do what he's commanded. Follow his Commandments. What he's basically saying is this. Submit your life to God's will, not your own will. This is the purpose of your life and the only thing that will ever really bring you satisfaction. Everything else is vanity. Everything else is in vain. This is how we do good. We submit ourselves to God. Jesus expands on this and makes it clear. After he enters in Palm Sunday, right after what we just read um, in chapter 12 of John, he says this. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. You got to hate your life. Isn't that a great sermon? Oh. What did your pastor preach about this Sunday? He told us we have to hate life. Oh, that's, I'm coming to that church. Um, it's not, yeah, downer. It's not like what it sounds like, okay? Let's walk through what we're talking about, okay? What does he mean? What does he mean? Well, here's what he means. He's not talking about hating life itself. God made life. God made the world. God made all these things. He said they were good. He said they were very good. We know it's broken and there's issues, but life is good. He's not talking about that. We're talking about the desire for the selfish pursuit of pleasure on your own terms. The selfish pursuit of pleasure on your own terms. We're talking about that. I'm in charge of me. I know what's best for me to, quote, be happy. I know what's best for me to be happy. We're talking about our own will, using our own will to get what we want the way we want it. My parents, when I was growing up, used to tell me to do stuff all the time. Take out the trash, David. That was my dad's voice. That was my impression of him. (laughs) Stop hitting your little brother, David. You know, you can't wear the same underwear 13 days in a row. (laughs) They're lucky I was wearing underwear at all. They're always trying to use their will to make me do stuff, right? You've met them. You know what they're like. (laughs) 
but I wanted to do things my way. I thought I knew what was best, and they didn't know. And a lot of times, my will was at odds with their will. That happens sometimes. And so whenever I thought I could get away with it, I did what my will wanted. Every time that I thought I could get away with it, and sometimes that did not work out. Okay? There was a period of time I remember when I was young, I, was, I don't know, I was probably 10 or 11 years old, and I thought that playing with fire was super cool. Kids, it's not, okay? And Glenn, it's not. Um, he's back there with a lighter. <laughs> I thought it was super cool. So I'm out there. I've got a couple of friends over, and we decide to like start making some fires. Okay, we lived on this church property in California, beautiful area, never rained. It was wonderful. Why did I come here? Um, but anyway, no, I'm kidding. It's terrible now. It smells bad. It's bad. Anyway, we were there, and we were making some fires outside. My dad was over at the church, and there was actually another church that was there um, doing something, and he was doing something with them. Anyway, we didn't think we, they could see us, right? So we're lighting this fire and whatever, and, and I was wrong. They could see us. And so a few minutes later, as we're <laughs> making fire and doing all this kind of stuff, all these people, my dad and all these people from this church come running, freaking out, you know, these uh, fire extinguishers, you know, doing all this kind of stuff because they wanted to put this fire out, right? I apparently was wrong about how secret I was being <laughs> in doing this. And here's the thing. It was a small fire next to a huge tree and a big pile of grass clippings that were dried out. <laughs> you expect me to think about everything? I'm supposed to put everything, you know? <laughs> Either way, it was my will. I wanted to light that fire. I wanted to do that because I thought it would make me happy. Now, when I was waiting at my house, we lived right next to the church, for my dad to get done with that after they had put this fire out and gone back, I started to rethink my decision-making matrix <laughs> as I recognized that his will was about to be used on my hind end. Um, <laughs> But I knew my mind. I knew what was best for me. I didn't want my parents or my teachers or my bosses or any of these people that end up in authority over us to tell me what to do. I wanted to live my life because I knew how to be happy. I knew how to be happy. And unfortunately, here's the thing, and this is where it gets uglier. I treated God the same way. I treated God the same way. Way Even when I was going to church as a young boy, as a young person, and I was memorizing the Bible verses, I remember we did like a Bible quiz thing, and we'd travel all around and like buzz and answer questions. I was a complete nerd. Um, but we, we would do that kind of stuff. I would learn all the Bible verses. I would go to Sunday. I used to wear a tie when I was young. I know it's hard to believe. I've got like holes in my jeans now and stuff. But listen, we just got to look at the salary. I mean, I can't afford, you know, I'm kidding. <laughs> kidding. Should we talk about that? No. Um, I'm totally kidding. Don't write me emails, please. If you do, it's glenn at axcamus.org. Um, <clears throat> I was going to church, and I, was, and, I, and I would say I love God, and I would do what he said. But here's the thing that was kind of weird about it. Whenever my will and what was in, in the Bible and here were the same, I was all about that. And I'd tell you about it. You ought not to do this or that or whatever. I can't believe you. But whenever my will and the Bible sort of diverted, the Bible was really old after all, right? And God probably didn't really mean that or he really doesn't know. He doesn't know me specifically and what I need to do and I obviously know a little bit better. That's the way that I was. If I liked it and it was easy for me, sure, the Bible was all good. But whenever my will and God's will were at odds with one another, I tended to want to go with my will. I, I'm sure that this hasn't happened to any of you, but this was how it was for me. God and I were all good whenever we agreed. Not so good when we didn't. And so, this is where the people were when Jesus enters Jerusalem that day as their king. They're in that place, right? And in the story, you know, we'd like to think that we're, you know, maybe the disciples that were really close to Jesus or whatever, but we're those people, right? That's kind of who we are in the story sometimes. We're, we're those people who are saying, save us, save us, right? And the question is, what do we mean? What do we mean when we say, save us? They wanted Jesus to be king, but they actually didn't want it so much for his sake and for loving God and so God could be glorified and so the Son of God could be glorified, but they really wanted it more for their sake. They were saying, Hosanna. They were saying, save us, Savior. 
But what they were asking to be saved from was not the thing that Jesus was coming to save them from. They were asking to be saved from their present difficulties. The things that were keeping them, that they saw as between them and happiness. You ever thought to yourself, if I could just get a raise at work, everything would be perfect. Problems would be solved. Or if I could just get her to marry me, everything would be perfect. And that's the way it worked, honey. Everything was perfect as soon as you said yes. She asked me. Let's be honest. Um, She did not. She did not. Give me a break. You're like, I don't even know how she said yes to you. But um, (laughs) if the Huskies just win another, Duck fans, another national championship, everything would be perfect, right? Whatever it is, fill in the blank. If this thing would just happen. If I could just, if only, everything would be good. Everything would be perfect. This is the thing that's between me and my happiness. I see it. I know it. I know what it takes to make me happy. And here's the thing between me and that. If this would just happen, I'd be happy. You have anything in your mind right now? Any of you have that going on? Just think through it. Are there those things that you're like, if I could just get this, I would be happy. If this would just happen, things would be good. Let me tell you something just to start out with. It's not true. If you're not happy without something, you're not going to be happy all of a sudden because you have it. Just so you know. If you think, single people often think marriage is going to solve all their problems. (laughs) Hear this, single people, you hear the laughter. (laughs) People are like, ha, ha, it's not. It's wonderful, right? It's a wonderful thing. It can be a wonderful thing. I know for my wife it's a wonderful thing. Um, (laughs) Don't ask her. Just trust me. Um, But it's not going to solve all your problems. People think if they have money, it's going to solve their problems. That's what they really want. Fame, fortune, health, wealth, I don't know, whatever, right? There's these things that people want, and they think that if they can get them, it's going to solve all their problems. But if you're not not satisfied, if you don't have joy now, you're not going to have it then. Sorry to burst your bubble if you're chasing hard after something, thinking that that's the thing that's going to solve your problems. It's not. Within no time at all, once you get that thing, even if it makes you happy for a minute, very soon it's going to be something else. You got the raise, and a couple months later, when that's kind of worn off, it's, well, the raise was good, but if I could just get the next promotion, then I'd really be happy. Or if I could just get that car, if I could just get that, whatever, there's always going to be something else. You'll never fill yourself if you're looking to save yourself with temporary fixes. You guys remember, um, if you've read the Old Testament, uh, the Israelites, they're in Egypt, and they're slaves, and they're being oppressed, and they're back-breaking work, and they're taking straw and making bricks and doing all this kind of stuff, and God comes, and he frees them, right? We celebrate what happened there this week at Passover. For those of you who are going to join us for the Seder meal, we'll be talking some about that. But God frees them. They get out. He's like splitting the Red Sea. People are walking through on dry land and they're following a pillar of cloud and fire. And there's like manna from heaven. Every morning they walk outside and there's just food on the ground. Okay? It's not, they don't even have to go to McDonald's. Nothing. It's just right there. Every single day. They just pick it up. How much food do you need today? Take enough for today. Take it inside. And with all of that going, the power of God and whatever, how long does it take before they say, where's the beef? Right? Where's the beef? You know, when we were in Egypt, we had leeks and onions. We had beef sometimes. They don't mention the fact that they were being beaten and oppressed and made to make bricks and whatever. They're like, sometimes we had food that tasted better than this food. That's where they were. What did they think at the time they were slaves? If we could just get out of here. Anything, I would do anything to just get out of here. They get out of there, and the next thing it's like, let's go back and be slaves again so that I can have onions. For those of you who don't like onions, you're like, what is wrong with these people? (laughs) Right? I like onions, so I sort of get it. No, I don't get it. But that's us. It's always something between us and our happiness. And rarely are we thinking about God for God, and how often are we thinking about God for get? Get me this, get me that. Sure, we can dress it up in very holy sounding terms, but I think we know what's going on. And meanwhile, I think that's the heart of some of these people putting palm branches in front of the king. Jesus, the king of kings, as he rides 
into Jerusalem. Savior, save us. Save us from what? From these things that are making me unhappy. From these temporary things that are making me, keeping me from pleasure. If I could just get this, everything would be perfect. You're the Savior. You're going to be the king. You're going to bring it. In this case, they were an occupied people. If you know the history, the Romans were occupying that area of Judea. Okay? And so the people who were there, generally occupied people don't like having an occupying force there. It's just one of those things we don't like. And so what they really wanted was Jesus to solve the temporary problem by riding into Jerusalem and going like Iron Man or whatever, you know, just superhero guy, like kicking out all the Romans and making the the nation of Israel the most powerful nation, right? God's chosen people, they're ready to come into their own. And they see him as that, right? They're looking for him to solve that temporary problem by ousting the Romans, by giving them right now, today, basically a certain amount of pleasure. Because what is that? At the end of the day, it's just something they see as something that will make their life better. They're in control instead of somebody else and so on. It was about loving their lives. It was about loving their lives. It was about seeking their lives. But Jesus was coming into Jerusalem for an eternal purpose with an eternal plan. And they couldn't see it. And they didn't like it. See, the Roman Empire is long gone. Long, long, long gone. A couple thousand years. But we're still talking about Jesus today in this room and in hundreds, thousands, if not millions of other rooms around the world. Because what he was doing had a lot more power than simply moving the Romans out of Israel at a certain time in a certain place. But they didn't see that. Right? Jesus was coming to Jerusalem to die. This was the beginning of his death, not the beginning of his kingdom, of his throne, of his temporary earthly throne. That's not what it was about. Jesus was coming to Jerusalem not to do his own will, not to do what he thought made him happy. And very few people think that it would make them happy to die on a cross. He wasn't there to do his own will. He was there to do the will of the Father and to lay down his life for you. That's what he was there to do. This is what Jesus says after telling us that he who loses his life will find it and he who hates his life will keep it and and that type of thing. After that, he says this. He says, remember, he's just coming to Jerusalem and and, and all that kind of stuff. He says, now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. This is right here in the triumphal entry, in the, in the, in the same section of, of uh, John 12 that we've been reading in Palm Sunday. Jesus is saying, listen, I'm troubled. I'm going to die. You don't understand. I've been telling you and telling you, but you don't get any of it because your mind is all about me coming and getting rid of these Romans. That's all you can think about. You don't understand the big thing. But I'm troubled. I'm hurting. I'm in pain. I know what's about to happen to me. You ever been waiting for your, like I told you earlier, my, waiting for my dad to come home? I was troubled in my soul. Because I knew I was about to be troubled in my bum. <laughs> Jesus is, is facing a million times more than that. He knows. He knows what's about to happen. He's troubled. And what does he say? Should I say, Father, save me? The same thing they're saying to him. Save us, Savior. Save us from what? the temporary difficulty that we're going through. No, he's not going to do that. He wants to glorify the Father for the will of the Father. He had submitted his will to the will of the Father. Jesus is God, but he submits his will to the will of the Father. He's not looking to be saved from this temporary problem because he understands. This is so important, so listen. He's not looking to be saved from the temporary problem because he understands that the temporary problem is part of this greater weight of glory is part of this eternal thing that God is doing, and he trusts the plan of the Father. And we're asked to do the same thing. Jesus was walking the walk, troubled in the soul, knew that pain was coming, suffering was coming soon, wasn't asking God to save him in that sense. Instead, he was going to do his will. Not that he didn't want to be saved. Later, he will pray. If it's your will, let it pass but not my will, your will, be done. He knew he was going to lay his life down, but he did not love his life. He did not seek his life. He did not go after life in a self-willed way. 
Instead, he hated his life in comparison to God. He was willing to lose his life to submit to the Father. He was willing to do his will, the Father's will. What greater testimony of following and trusting the will of God the Father do we have than Jesus being willing to lay his life down? Because that was the Father's will. And Jesus' action in laying his own life down for the Father's will makes it so powerful when he makes these statements, like in Luke 17, 33, where he says, whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. That has real meaning because that's what he did. That's what he did. The people wanted Jesus to beat the Romans. You might want that new house, that new car. You want your husband to stop being a jerk, right? Right? You want whatever it is. Maybe it's, maybe it's you, you're, you're sick. You want to be healthy. Whatever it is. And there's nothing wrong with wanting certain things. But Jesus did not come to save us from the lack of pleasure or the suffering that might come from living in a broken world. That's not primarily why he came. He came to save you from your sin. He came to save me from my sin. A much bigger deal. He came to give us eternal life. He didn't come so we could have all the things that we think will make us happy. That's not what it's about. I know that there are people out there who, who want to use Jesus as a genie to solve the problems of the temporary world, but they're just in the same line, that long line of people, some of whom were laying down branches in front of his feet, in front of that colt that he's riding on, who are saying, save us, but what they really mean is save us from our temporary troubles functionally save us so we can be happy all the time. If I got all the things that I wanted in life, all the things that I ever thought in my own will would be good, I'd be in very big trouble right now. I certainly wouldn't be here. What we want is usually not, not even often not, usually not the best plan because we can't see enough but God can. God has preserved my life in many ways by keeping me from things that I wanted, by by not saving me from things that I thought I wanted saving from, by letting me go through those things and by giving me other things. His will has been good. God has preserved my life to do his will because seeking my own life has only ever brought despair and dissatisfaction. I can just attest to that. That's my testimony. When I seek, when I sought my own life, when I went after my own life, my own will, all that ever happened was dissatisfaction. And seeking the Father's will has always brought joy, even when there was suffering attached. I have always had joy when I know I'm in the Father's will. There's nothing like knowing that you're in the Father's will. I've always had joy, even when suffering was attached. There was joy. Palm Sunday is this day where if we look at it, we can see this is bringing out the distinction between your will, between my will, our will, and God's will. You have the people who are putting palm branches down saying, save us, but it's all about their own will. And probably a much smaller number who actually are saying, no, this is about God. This is about glorifying him. This is about loving him. Most people just wanted a savior from their temporary unhappiness. But God's will was to save us from our sin for eternal life. Why do you call him king? That's what you have to answer today. Because certainly all of us, right? We'd all grab the palm branches. We'd all, grab, we'd all grab the palm branches and lay them down. But why do you call him king? Why do we call him king? I mean, let's be honest. Are there not a hundred churches right just in this town where they were playing music just like we were earlier? And there are people, even people who are like, they may even be saying Hosanna in the songs. It's Palm Sunday after all. And they might be raising their hands and they'd be happy. And if Jesus wrote that, we'd all go out and put the palm branches down. The question that you have to ask yourself, because that's who they were too. They were coming. They were religious people. They were saying the king coming to town. They would have sung and been like, Hosanna. The whole thing. They were doing that. And a week later, some of them were saying, crucify him. So who are we? Why are we calling him king? This is a real question for me and for you. I'm preaching to myself here. We've got to ask ourselves, why are we calling Jesus king? Is Jesus the king of kings because he's going to solve your temporary problems? Because if that's the case, and listen very closely, if the truth is when you search your heart that you're following Jesus primarily 
primarily not for him and for love and to be forgiven for your sins and just out of, out of this intense love for God that has come because he died for you, but, but you're serving him or you're calling him king because you have an expectation that he's going to solve your problems, then within the week you could be yelling crucify him. That could be you. Let's be honest. We've seen it before. How many people have we seen? How many, people, how many of us have been there and done this where we're following God and something bad happens and it's tough? And we either walk away, we may not yell crucify him, but we ain't in church, right? We're mad at him or wherever we are. This is the nature of it. Part of growing in the Lord is going from that place of I follow him so he can give to me to that place of I follow him because I love him because I trust his will no matter what happens. That's a difficult place to get. If you follow Jesus because of who he is, because you believe the Father's will is the best will for you, because you believe that he will work all things together for good for those who love him, for those who are called according to his purpose, then that's the real deal. But if you're following him so he can save you from your personal temporary discomfort, you got a problem. Jesus is saving us from our sin and separation from God, a much more significant thing and an eternal thing. Now, if you're wondering which one is you, your life will tell the story. Just look at it. I think every one of us has a little bit of both. Not a lot. Listen to what Jesus tells us in Luke 14, 27. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Cannot be my disciple. If we are true disciples of Jesus Christ, we are bearing our cross. We're bearing our cross. What does the cross represent? Death. Right? Another place that's bearing your cross daily. Get up and die. What Death to what? Death to ourself and our self-love and our selfishness. Death to our desires to be in charge instead of having God be in charge. Right? Death to trusting ourselves to know our own good and instead life to trusting God that he knows what's best for our good. This is what it means to be a Christ follower and this is what it looks like to be a Christ follower. He says right here, you cannot be my disciple if you don't do this. You cannot be my disciple if what you're really chasing is life because the first thing my disciples do is bear their cross, representing death. If the, if the thing that you really want is for God to come and make things better, and that's it. That's not discipleship. That's a lamp that you're rubbing. That's genie Jesus. And genie Jesus doesn't exist. No offense, genie. David. <laughs> Different kind of gene. <laughs> I realized that I was saying it. Genie Jesus. Well, I don't. Anyway, that's not who Jesus is. That's not who he is. It's death to self. It's death to self. That's what it means to be Christ. Now, you look at your life, you look at your bank account, you look at how you're spending your time, and ask yourself Am I doing my will or the will of the Father? It's very simple. I don't think, I can tell you right now, if there's a test and I'm looking at my life, am I doing my will or the Father's will? There's a lot of places where I'm going to have to check the my will box. And those are things that God's working with me on. You've got to ask him what he's working with you on. But you have to have the mindset that you want to be there. His will, not your will. A disciple has got to look like the one who's being followed. The disciple has to look like the master. Jesus is the master. Our life should look like Jesus' life. That means we do not run from temporary pain when God calls us to face it. It means we do not use our own judgment when God has given us clear commands. So all that stuff that I used to do when I, God and I disagreed, the Bible said something different than what I thought, and I, and I substitute my own judgment and explain how, you know, whatever, and as you get older, you get more, you get more fancy with it. And you start saying, well, I think what God was really saying, if we take it in context and we look at the whatever, we try to find some, some way to interpret Scripture. And you, can, and you can go online and find plenty of this. Go look at Reddit or go look at, frankly, any website that's trying to, trying to say something different than what the text of the Bible clearly says. People do this at a very high level. People confuse themselves at a very high level. They allow themselves to interpret Scripture differently. They allow, all of it is, a, is an attempt to have their will be substituted for God's will. 
All of it is that attempt. We don't get to do that. We don't get to use our own judgment. That's not what Jesus did. Jesus said, I'm here to do the will of the Father. He was an example for us. It means that we realize that all of this, dying to ourselves, living in the Father's will, is only possible with the power of the Holy Spirit. Got to have the Holy Spirit. You ever wonder why I do this? I don't mean you ever wonder why anyone ever let me become a pastor. We all wonder that. I mean, why I do it in general. Like, why, why this instead of something else? Here's why. It's really simple. I walked my own way, in my own will, in my own judgment for a long time. I sought my own pleasure, and I had convinced myself that I had it figured out. And it's not like I was waking up in the morning twisting my mustache and thinking about what evil I could do. If you would have asked me, I would have told you I was a very uh, unselfish person, even though I was totally selfish. I would have told you I cared a lot about other people, even though I pretty much only cared about myself. But that's not what I thought. I thought I was a pretty decent guy. I was pretty good. I mean, especially compared to so-and-so. Right? Eventually, that so-and-so got... That the, the comparison had to get worse and worse, right? Um, but that was, you know, especially compared to so-and-so. Live my own life, my own will. And in that, God showed me over time that, that that lifestyle was only leading to death and pain and suffering and dissatisfaction. And he broke me over it. I realized my sin and my folly and my shame. And when that happened, I ran to God and I held on tight and I don't ever want to let go. I don't ever want to let go. I, w- I am humbled and honored that God has called me to serve him in life. Now, he happened to call me to serve as a pastor, but that actually doesn't, he could have called me to do anything, anywhere. And I'd be happy to do it to be in his will. I just want to do his will. Because here's the thing, folks. If you haven't seen this, let me tell you my own story. He has shown and proven to me time and time again over time that his will is good and mine is a joke. He has shown me over and over and over that his wisdom is wise and mine is foolish. And here's the thing. I always think I know what's right. I've always got an answer, right? Right or wrong, I'm never in doubt. I've always got an answer. But he's proven to me that his will is good, and so I want to be in it. I want to be in it. I mean, you have to ask yourself, why, why do people ask a young person, what do you want? You know, and it, may, it could be a million things. I want to be rich. I want to be famous. You know, often I want to be adored. Go on your social media and you'll see that people, there are some people who seem to really, really, really thrive on adoration. They want lots of likes and, and whatever for their content. And it can be, and it can be sort of uh, tempting to be in that thing. Why do they want, in all these cases, in all these things, people are looking for something to satisfy them. Well, money means nothing. It's just paper, right? Having a lot of paper is meaningless. If you, some of you may have seen the Facebook meme in the Venezuela in the streets, and there's all this like money in the streets because it's, it's basically worthless because of the inflation issue and so on. Money is just paper at the end of the day unless it has some value. And what it represents to a lot of people is that they're going to be happy. Is that that security that it brings or whatever it is that it brings is going to bring them happiness, pleasure, and whatever. Solomon says those who chase after silver will never be satisfied. Satisfied by it. Those who want abundance will never, it'll never be enough, right? We think these things are going to make us happy, but God is asking us to believe that he is going to make us happy. That we got to lay down our own lives for his will. Now, the question that's asked, I was talking to my wife, Tiffany, about this yesterday, and, I, and, and she said, well, but what about when times are hard? It's easy to talk about following Jesus and doing his will and walking in his way, but what about when things get tough? What about when the suffering is real? We lose a loved one. Right? Our marriage is on the rocks. We run out of money. We have a bankruptcy. Whatever it is, we get evicted. What happens in those times? What happens when following Christ means suffering? Well, we do what any disciple of Jesus Christ would do. We look to Jesus. We look to him. Jesus suffered intensely for the joy that was set before him. Let's look at Hebrews 12, 1 through 4. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, 
the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. He has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. <coughs> for consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not resisted the bloodshed striving against sin. What do you do when suffering comes? You endure for the joy set before you. You endure for the joy set before you. Jesus himself did not get to avoid suffering. He didn't show us that you got to avoid suffering in this fallen, broken world. He showed us that you could endure it. We are his joy, by the way. That joy that was set before him is you. It's you and me and that the Father would be glorified. And it was for that that he was able to endure the pain and suffering, for that joy, for that hope, as he was being beaten and bruised and mocked and nailed to a cross. It was for you and for me and the joy of knowing that we could have relationship with him, that it could be reestablished as he's praying, Father, forgive these people, for they don't know what they're doing. The very people who are beating him and nailing him to a cross. Why? Because it was about the joy that one day there would be relationship there. And you have the same joy. You have him. You have each other. You have eternity. You have relationship. It's the same for us. We have a joy that's set before us. I'm not here to tell you that there will not be pain. There's probably somebody you can go find that will tell you that. But that's not me. Because it's not true. I'm here to tell you, not that there's no pain, but that every tear will be wiped away. I'm not here to tell you that there's no suffering, but that all things will be made new. And every bit of your suffering is worth enduring for the joy set before you in eternal life with Jesus Christ. Every bit. We have joy now in Christ, and we'll have joy for eternity in Christ. Remember this, though. You're, you're either suffering now, or you've just come out of some suffering, or you're probably going into some, right? It's the nature of the world. Don't forget that the person sitting next to you is in the same place. They're either suffering now, or they've just come out of it, or they're going into it. It's a reason why we're a body. Don't forget that in all of this. Everybody will experience pain, right? Only, only Christ followers can truly know why and what the end is and how to have joy in it. So recognize that you, you all need each other's help. We all need each other's help. As a Christ follower, recognize this also. People are watching you. People are watching you for how you deal with pain and suffering. If you believe you have the answer to it, if you believe there's a joy set before you, if that's how you endure it, then you should show that with your life. Because anybody, anything that says, no, 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 come to Christ and you won't have pain, that people know a bad sales pitch when they hear one. Right? That's why you flip by most of the Facebook ads, except for the ones we put out. I hope that you like those and share them. <laughs> people know a bad sales pitch. Oh, come to Jesus and you're not going to have pain. No. Instead, show them what it looks like to endure before the joy set before you. Because people are watching. And that, Jesus will use that to draw people to himself. Live thinking about the joy. The joy. Live in the joy. Remember that when we lose our life for Jesus' sake, we gain. To die is gain. We trade that which is perishing for that which is eternal. We, we trade that which we cannot sustain for that which God will sustain eternally. We trade loneliness for relationship with God. We trade sadness for joy. Remember there's a parable about a guy who finds this treasure and he goes and buries it in the field and he goes takes everything he has and sells it so he can buy the field that's got the treasure in it. You know that? You ever had something you just loved like that? When, I was, when, I, when we had Corey, our first child, um, I remember we, you know, uh, contractions and all that good stuff. I didn't have to deal with any of that. My wife dealt with all that. Started one night. Corey was born the next night. So by the time she was born and, you know, we cleaned her up and got her to stop crying, for goodness sakes. You know, it was, she actually was really good. Um, she knew. Um, we, I was tired, and I, and I went home. 
I was like, okay, everything's good. We're all good. I left Tiffany there, and Corey went home. I was home for like a half hour. I was like, I got to go back. It's my baby. This is my daughter. There's joy in it. I wanted to be where she was. Y'all ever, when you, when you met your spouse, you were dating them or whatever, you remember those times when you just wanted to be where they were? You just wanted to be in the same place that you had joy, right? Whether it's your children, whether it's your spouse, look, whether it's, whether it's the, you know, brand new baseball card that you got or whatever that thing is that you have, that when you, when you have certain things, you want, you have joy. Even when you're not around them, you have joy, you know when you're going to get to them. It's a weak comparison to the joy that we have in knowing that we're going to be with Christ, and knowing that we're going to be with every Christ follower ever, and knowing that we're going to have amazing things to do. But I'm just trying to give you an idea. When there's joy in something, your spouse, your children, whatever, it not only makes things amazing when you come home and get to be in the midst of the joy, but it actually takes everything else and gives color to that part of life too. Because you have that joy that's set before you. I know what's happening when I go home today. That vacation. Well, the cooks went to Disney World. Yes. They're going to clap for that. Okay. Um, Glenn just wanted to see Mickey. Got an autograph, took pictures with him. I think they had to ask him to leave, but, it, you know, it, but they went. They went, right? And there was joy, not so much in Glenn, but in Julie. For like three weeks before, I think she was about this high off the ground. She's like, mm, Disney princesses. You're right. Whatever. Look, it's a sickness. But, but listen, knowing it was coming, it was a joy that was set before her, made everything else easier to deal with. <laughs> you're at work and that person's being a jerk and you're like, they're a real jerk, but I'm going to Disney in a week. <laughs> it's the same way here. Only a million times more. I got to deal with this, but I got Jesus. I got to deal with this, but eternity is coming and all things are going to be made new and all things are going to work together for good and I have that joy inside my heart. I have that coming. Right? We are not... As Christians, in a place to avoid pain, Christianity is not the antidote to pain. Christianity has the answer for pain. You need to understand the difference. We're not here because you're going to avoid all pain. But you're the only ones who can truly have an abiding joy deep inside you that passes understanding. Why does it pass understanding? Because nobody understands how you could have joy when you're in pain. It passes understanding. Only Christians have this. Only Christians are not self-deluded who have this because they know who they've believed in and they're persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. We know what's happening. We know where we're going. We know the end of the story. And so we can deal with a little bit of temporal pain that will be nothing in the scope of eternity. We don't want to be those putting branches down in front of Jesus one day and saying, save me, but really saying, save me for my own pain. It's just not who we want to be. We want to be the people putting branches down in front of Jesus saying, you are the king. I'll go through whatever. I'll follow you. I'll, I'll carry my own cross. I'll be like you. I'll suffer where I need to suffer because the joy is set before me. Now, now, don't get me wrong because I don't want this to be sort of a downer where you're like, well, it sounds like I'm in, I guess. I mean, I'm already in. I came to church today. I guess I have to do this. It's just suffering. The rest of my life, wish I never would have filled out that dang connection card. They're going to send that to God, and he's going to be like, suffer. It's not how it works. It's kind of like that, but that's not exactly how it works. We just pray that you'll suffer. It's a different thing altogether. No, listen. My life is good. I enjoy it. I love it. God wants you to love it. I'm not saying that life is pain all of the time. Life is amazing. The world that God made is good. You guys are good. I love being here with you. You should love being with each other. Most of what we do, we should be relatively happy. Okay? But I'm not talking about happiness. I'm talking about joy right now. I'm talking about the thing that in those times when life is not good, is sustaining you through. That is what these people did not have when they started yelling, crucify him. They were upset because of the temporary happiness was what they were expecting. And when they didn't get it, Jesus was just another functional savior that didn't do his job for them instead of recognizing that he was the true savior of the world. What do, what do we recognize? That's what we got to ask ourselves today. I'm not telling you you're going to have to sit here and suffer all the time. It's not my point. I don't live my life in constant suffering. But when I do suffer, I have an answer. 
When I do suffer, I have a hope before me. I can still have a joy in my salvation, in my brothers and sisters in Christ. That's all I'm saying. I'm just saying, why is Jesus your king? Because of what he's going to do for you or because of what he's already done for you? Has the thing that's made Jesus king something that he's done, dying on the cross and what we're going to celebrate next Sunday, his resurrection from the dead? Or is it something that he has to do now? Well, okay, that's all good, but what have you done for me lately? I'd like a little more money. I'd like a little more of this. I'd like a little more of that. I'd like a little bit of my own free will to do what I want. I'd like to not have to follow maybe everything that's in this book here. So fix all that, and we're good. Which one is it? Where are you? Ask yourself and be honest with yourself. And if today you don't even know Jesus, if you've never chosen to follow him at all, then you don't even know what I'm talking about with the kind of joy that I'm talking about, with the thing that's deep and abiding. It's much more substantial than happiness. Any human that's been alive more than about a day knows that happiness comes and goes. But joy is abiding. It stays with you. If you want that, you can make that commitment today. You can have that present and that future joy in Jesus Christ now. And ask yourself, have I chosen to follow Christ? Does my life look like what Pastor David's talking about? Has Jesus become my king because he died for my sins? Because he's God, because he's amazing, because he created the world, because he created me, because he made everything, because he's good? Or is it because of what I've kind of been thinking he would do for me? Was this a quid pro quo? Was this I give something, you give something? Or was this you've already done everything and I submit my life to you? Does my life look like I follow the will of God or not? If, if the answer to those things is no, it's not. I haven't followed for that purpose. Then today is the day either to come to Jesus for the first time or to recommit yourself to living in his will. Because if you don't do that, we're just, it's just too easy to fall away. It's too easy to yell crucify him when things don't go well. And I don't know many Christians who haven't been in that situation. Including me. Where you, you move away because you don't get what you want. Let's, let's, let's ask ourselves, is that where we are? And if it is, let's get back in his will. Let's start living for his will. Let's endure for the joy set before us. Well, thanks for listening to that Acts Church sermon. We hope you got a lot out of it. If you did, we'd love it if you would comment or uh, give us a review or give the track a like. Uh, It really means a lot to us to hear back from people who have um, heard these sermons and have been impacted by it. So share your story with us. Share what is happening in your life um, that this is speaking into. And remember, you can subscribe to our iTunes podcast or through SoundCloud so that you can get all of our releases as soon as they come out. Thanks again for listening, and we'll be back with more next week.